Hi, I'm Jenny Shampo, the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and we're so glad to be joined today by Dr. Richard Bushman. Welcome. Hi, good to be here. Thank you for being with us. Dr. Bushman is an American historian and the Gouverneur Morris Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University. He was the first Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University, and he authored uh, the Joseph Smith biography, Rough Stone Rolling. He is the chairman of the board for the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. Um, so we're really excited to hear his, his expertise today. We're looking at Alma chapters 32 to 35 this week, and the artwork is um, called Parable of the Seed. It's by the artist Lisa DeLong. She did this in 2015, and it actually won a merit award in the church's international art competition that year. It's now in a private collection. And the materials she used are um, handmade uh, watercolor paper, uh, ink, gold leaf, um, and gum Arabic. Um, so uh, Dr. Bushman, first, I just want to situate us in the scriptures here. How is this artwork related to what's happening in Alma 32? Well, I see it as a very direct relationship, the way I read the painting. Um, Alma 32 uh, has this marvelous promise that if you cultivate a seed, it will grow into great faith and be a huge blessing to your life. And so this is a picture of what I see as three things. Uh, one is a beautiful flower generated by geometric procedures that uh, sits up there with its many 12-sided um, flowers and so forth. And um, then outside of it, is a very slithery, swampy mess of uh, of streams and lines slithering uh, through the space. But just below the flower, one little gold seed. And so I think uh, Lisa DeLong is inviting us to contemplate the relationship between the flower and the and the seed. Mm -hmm. I actually think that uh, she sees it one way, I see it another. I'm sure she's right, but the great thing about paintings is everybody's right. Um, she sees the, the flower. I, I've seen this little comment she's made on the subject that you sent me, so that's why I'm speaking authoritatively here. Mm -hmm. She sees um, the flower as the product of the seed growing that it will become a flower. I see the flower as something divine with its beautiful geometric and intricacy and, and beauty and many lines and all of it, you know, it's, it's so um, precise. Mm -hmm. And I see it representing something glorious, God himself. And the seed dropping from the flower into the earth which is messy and, and not really glorious. It's not made to appear glorious here anyway. And the question is, what will happen to that seed? Will mm -hmm. the seed be cultivated? Will it be cared for? Will it grow into something beautiful? And I think that's the intent of Alma 32, is to say, if you cultivate that seed, it will grow into something divine, something holy and spiritual, uh, your own your own faith and your own your own glorification, your own being blessed yourself. Oh, I, I love that interpretation. Uh, and I like the way you're reversing that a little bit. Um, and maybe seeing seeing ourselves in that little seed floating in <clears throat> kind of a dreary wasteland, but having the potential within it to become something greater and more divine. Yeah. So in, in this chapter in Alma 32, um, Alma has gone to preach to the Zoramites and he tells us they've, you know, they've separated from the Nephites. They've, they've gone off the rails a little bit. They're, 
they're worshiping idols. Um, they have this ramyumptum that they prey on. They have really stark class divisions with a wealthy class and, and a poorer class. And it's actually this, this poorer class of people that Alma is preaching to here and talking about the word as a seed. Um, so I, I, I think that's kind of interesting too, just, um, the, the context of, of what's happening, especially if their if their religion has shifted more towards um, graven images and idol worship. And then I like what Lisa DeLong is doing here in her stylistic approach is much more an iconic that it's, it's non-representational. It's non-figurative. It's more, like you said, the sort of sacred geometry that she's using. I think that's a really nice contrast to maybe what Alma was seeing with the Zoramite people. So I wanted to ask you, how how do you see this piece stylistically fitting in to the history of, of Latter-day Saint visual arts? Well, it tackles a perpetual problem in Latter-day Saint art particularly, but in, I guess, religious art generally, and that is how do you depict the divine yeah. or the spiritual or or the, the holy? And um, it's a per special problem for Latter-day Saints because we have this description of God as being like us, yeah. so it's sort of a human. But it's very hard to create an image that is both human and glorious. And Lisa DeLong maneuvers around this problem and uses an abstraction to speak of it. I don't know if this flower is meant to be God or Christ or just the, the spirit, but either way, it uses the precision and the intelligence and sort of the, the geometric ingenuity mm -hmm. as a way of depicting God. And I think, especially for someone like yourself who's so enamored of geometry, quite obviously, mm -hmm. a wonderful way to suggest the glory of God and his immense intelligent, intelligence that encompasses all things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I like the contrast in this image between this sort of swirling chaos of the background, and then this very um, defined and precise design in in the the flower or the design. Um, I know some some scholars, um, Adam Miller, Jenny Webb, David Bakavoy, they've talked about Alma thirty two as <clears throat> drawing on some of the language from Genesis in the creation narrative in Genesis and ideas like um, the 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 light that Alma talks about and um, bringing forth goodness and um, these themes of knowledge and 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 a tree springing up a a, a good tree a tree of life and um, <clears throat> so I, I I thought that was interesting too this maybe Lisa's pulling a little bit of these ideas of creation in even as you said with that little gold see that's that's dropped into this sort of formless void but has the potential to grow into something well uh, she is emphasizing uh the scientific the mathematical mm -hmm. as sort of a, the groundwork of the whole universe yeah and um so um that's one way of seeing god that is also, I think, very appealing to Latter-day Saints. The glory of God is intelligence. Mm -hmm. All the, the um, you know, the, the deep comprehension of the inner structure of things, which right. is sort of implied by these beautiful patterns. Right. So, all right. So let's look a little bit at the symbolism she uses here then. Um in her in her artist statement that you referenced, um, she talks about how she intentionally used um, a circle and a square, which in both Christian and Islamic art, it often has reference to the union of of heaven and earth. Um, do you see that playing out out here, or are there other other symbols that you notice in this piece? 
it it is reminiscent of Islamic art, you know, which just replicates patterns gorgeously, and because they um, do not want to re represent God as human in any way. I mean, that's mm -hmm. forbidden. Right. So, um, pattern is the only way that they could capture God, and so I think uh, yes, you can certainly uh, pick that out. I kind of like the beautiful simplicity. Uh, that is, all you need are these two instruments, mm -hmm. compass and the square, yeah. and you can make endless patterns and sort of describe infinitely vari variable universes mm -hmm. just with the, that, that great instrument. And so um, maybe that is implied that Truth has a basic simplicity to it. Mm -hmm. We get the basic things right and know how to use those instruments. We can do anything. We can create universes. I just want to wrap up with just getting your personal reaction to Alma Thirty Two and and this artwork and um, and again how how you think um, maybe this fits in with. The, the history of Latter-day Saint art? I myself um, treasure Alma 32 above almost any scripture I can think of because I think it is a simple answer to the difficult problems of our age. You know, we live in the age of science and we need proof. And uh, how are we to believe uh, in the existence of a deity. And here, you know, you have this very simple procedure of follow the good and just see where it leads. Mm -hmm. And if these little seeds make you better, if they enlarge your scope, if they enlarge your heart, um, you don't want to throw them away. You have to hold on to them and keep cultivating them, and who knows where you'll end up. So I, the fact that she sort of exemplifies this by showing how she, through her beautiful manipulation of the, of the compass and the square, did create something that's increasingly beautiful and could go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the promise of of gospel living and the exer the exercise of faith uh, mm -hmm. in our time. And so I actually mm -hmm. adore the scripture and I'm just thrilled with her representation of it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I love the way she's captured this idea of transformation. And, and there's a feeling in this piece that the work isn't finished yet, that there's, there's still potential of more to come. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. It was a great pleasure, Jenny. I enjoy conversation with you. <laughs>